Hello, everyone. Uh, we are glad to have Matthew Gabriel and David Perry with us. Uh, Matthew Gabriel is a professor of medieval studies and the chair of, uh, chair of the Department of Religion and Culture at Virginia Tech. He's the author of numerous academic books and articles on religious, culture, and intellectual life of the European Middle Ages. And David Perry is a freelance journalist covering politics, history, education, and disability rights. Perry's work has appeared in uh, CNN, The New York Times, The Atlantic, The Guardian, Washington Post, The Nation, uh, among others, Perry was a professor of medieval history in the, at the Dominican University from 2006 to 2017. And they've recently re, uh, written a, a wonderful book called The Bright Ages, A New History of Medieval Europe, a book that I have to wait here until March to get my hands on, which is a painful <laughs> uh, wait. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew and David, for being here. It's such a, a pleasure. pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Uh, there are... There are lots of questions that I'd like to ask, but uh, the very first thing is the title of the book, The Bright Ages. More recently, I've noticed that there are more and more academics um, have been starting writing about the Middle Ages, and I've been trying to correct a lot of uh, misunderstanding and myths about the Middle Ages. So tell us a little about this book and why you decided to call it The Bright Ages. You know, we wanted to go right at the myth of the Dark Ages. The myth of the Dark Ages I mean, in some ways, as, as we actually talk about in the epilogue of the book, was really started by Petrarch in the late 14th century and has run more or less without pause till today. And there have been lots of people throughout the whole time saying, hey, wait a minute. In fact, this thousand years of human history was more complicated. There was beauty as well as horror. I mean, really, from right from the beginning, there's been a counter narrative. But I think it's fair to say that the Dark Ages story has won. And we have a lot of work to do to try to unravel it. And so, you know, we didn't just want to write an account of things that happened over this thousand year period in Europe. We wanted to make an argument, which was to go right at this myth of the dark ages and say, this is not the best way to tell the story of this time and this place. Yeah. And just to, just to add to that a little bit is that I think that we're very careful in the book is encountering this myth of the dark ages. It's not just simply say it's the opposite of that, it's, that right. it's a time of, of greatness and wonder, anything like that, but rather to use the metaphor of light, of brightness, to cast, you know, to, to illuminate the past and to show both the good and the bad of what happened and, you know, the, these towering works of beauty, but also at the same time, the horror and the atrocities that were committed at that time. Thank you for this modification. And uh, I read an article from you, Matthew, which I found uh, wonderful. It was published on, on Forbes, I guess. And the first paragraph, first two paragraphs kind of cracked me up. So people wake up, right? I think it was in Venice. You draw the curtains. There's beauty and light. Good morning, Renaissance. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, goodbye with the dark ages. So let us yeah. talk about this, the, the, the invention of Renaissance or this, the myth of Renaissance as if there was absolutely nothing before before that, and the modernity started with the Renaissance. And you also, in that article, you mentioned um, a Swiss historian, uh, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, Jacob Burkhardt, who Burkhardt, kind yeah. of cemented this myth of the Renaissance. Could, can you tell us a little about that one? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think this is this is this is something that all medievalists kind of rage against, right? Is the idea that um, that uh, there was something magical and wonderful that happened immediately after the end of the Middle Ages? Is that there's a period of darkness um, again? And this goes back to what David was talking about earlier about this kind of myth of the Dark Ages: is that you emerge into the light, right? And that there's this this period of rebirth. I mean. Uh, you know, again, as David mentioned, is that this is this is a myth that's been with us since you know the 1400s, in which the especially Italian thinkers were um, were um, <laughs> here we are. This is this is this is how life is now, right? With all right, inter uh, sorry interjections for the interruption just there. coming right in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, where was I? All right. So, so since the 1400s is that Italian thinkers at the time were very conscious of um, kind of their own situating themselves and trying to create the sense that they were different, they were better than what had come before, um, mostly from a from an artistic point of view, but also from a, a you know a political and cultural point of view as well. That they were returning to something that had been lost, kind of the glories of of Rome and the empire and, and things of that nature, right? Um, and you know that 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 lasted for for a certain amount of time, but I think the the thing that 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 
uh, uh, haunts us to this day is really this 18th and 19th century, this enlightenment ideal in which Western historians, Jacob Burkhardt, a Swiss historian, um, most famous for a book called The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, um, kind of cemented into being this idea that the modernity owed everything to this, to pulling themselves out of the dark ages. And what really um, made that happen was not just this, this intellectual flowering that happened in Italy, but the reformation of, of Christianity, the creation of Protestantism, breaking away from the superstition of um, the medieval church, of medieval Christianity, into kind of this rational um, um, understanding of, 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 of the world. I mean, there's, there's literally, as I talk about in that Forbes article, right, this literally this metaphor of a veil being pulled away so that the people of the Renaissance could see the world in its reality. Um, and that's, that's, that's simply not true. Like as we talk about in, in the book itself, right, is that, that everything that happened in the Renaissance the Renaissance, I'll put, you know, air quotes around it, happened in the Middle Ages as well. That, you know, it, it isn't something that, there isn't this kind of world transformational moment that will, um, that, that, that happens in which you transition between periods, but rather they're, they're slow, gradual movements. And yes, by the 14, 1500s, you know, things are qualitatively different, but, you know, there's reasons that they're different in these particular ways. And they, they have very long lineages that go back into what we call um, the medieval world. Thank you. Um, and um, you, the, the, the one thing I find amazing is that, yes, you rightly mentioned all these uh, achievements have already been in the Middle Ages, but there, there, there is this tendency to just veil over it. And uh, talking about Renaissance, there was also a 9th century Renaissance in the Middle Ages. There was also a 12th century Renaissance. And just as David mentioned at the beginning, there was all this. It, you're, you're right. It's not all about beauty and progress, but that is certainly an integral part of it. Universities were born in the Middle Ages. We had this blossoming of art. So can you, and there is, there was a book uh, which I guess published last year, uh, The Light Ages, which is, which only focuses on the scientific achievements, which is again, a wonderful book. Uh, so can you tell us about the Renaissance in the 12th century, maybe, or the Renaissance in the Middle Ages in general? What is that? What were some of the great achievements they had? You know, I, I just want to say that I'm, I'm kind of opposed to the idea of Renaissance, of rebirth in general, except for as an argument. I'm very interested in how people make arguments about the, the relationship between themselves and the past. I'm interested in it as a scholar in terms of how uh, Venetians in the 13th century made arguments about the past couple hundred years. I'm interested in, in the people in the 15th century in Florence. I'm interested in, in, in Americans right now and how we're talking about the 19th century. I mean, I'm, I'm very, that, that process of how people connect themselves to the past, both by saying, this thing was good and we're like that. So that's Renaissance or this thing was bad and we're not like that. That's the dark ages. I'm, I'm very interested in that process. And I would say it's a very human way with differences in different times and places and peoples of, of organizing yourself and locating yourselves in time. And one of the ways that medieval people did it was to say, these things that have happened are happening again now. Um, and sometimes we call that a Renaissance. I do think we can look at moments in which wealth and power focus on supporting intellectual and artistic developments in more or less in different time periods. So if we look at the, and, and, and understanding why that happens. So if we look at this thing called the 12th century Renaissance, I'm, I'm opposed to calling it a Renaissance, but we can look at the ways in which wealth and power in the 12th century did different things in terms of supporting intellectual and artistic development. Um, Matt here is the Carolingianist, so he could talk more about the ninth century. But I think it's, I mean, that, so that's the framework that I like to go into it and, and abandon this word Renaissance as a historian to say, this was a rebirth. Keep the word Renaissance as, a, as an analytic framing. They talked about it as rebirth, but then, and then, and then have a different conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, I mean, one of the things that historians did or medievalists did initially is they tried to take the terms that they didn't like, as David was saying, this idea of Renaissance, and just pull it into their own period. And so when Charles Homer Haskins wrote that book, The 12th Century Renaissance in the 1920s, right, is it, he was just basically trying to move 
um, this idea of Renaissance back into his own period, into a period he was comfortable with. And then you have, then, you know, people in the 10th century did it with the Atonian Renaissance, and then people in the 9th century did it with the Carolingian Renaissance, etc. Like, it, it's not changing the idea of the Middle Ages, like, which has a beginning and an end point. It's just kind of shrinking that, that quote unquote, dark age, right? Is that the dark age doesn't go into the 14th century, now it goes to the 12th century. Oh, no, it goes to the 10th century. Oh, no, it goes to the 9th century, etc. It always starts with this kind of fall of Rome idea whatever that means, which in our book we try to push back against. Um, but there's always this, this kind of thing of darkness. And I think David's absolutely right. Like we're trying to say like, like what if we just don't talk about a Renaissance? Like that, that's, that is an argument and we understand that argument. We're gonna talk about why they make that argument, but it, it doesn't make sense if we're talking about these, these particular moments and putting them into the proper context. Yeah, thank you. There's always this problem with uh periodization in history as you rightly mentioned but it's just good to use it as an argument as, as, as a pitch for an argument yeah and uh, one of the most enduring myths about the middle ages is that the church was completely against uh, science against progress the church was responsible for the let's say dark ages uh, whereas uh, no matter of fact we know that church was a supporter of science the universities were born in uh, with the support of the church yeah. astronomy medicine and can you tell us a little bit about that? And maybe, and, and parts of these myths also come from um, Protestants' um, propaganda, let's say, against the Catholic Church or Catholicism in general. And also, these myths were more solidified in the 19th century. So, um, I, I'm, uh, because I, I still haven't read the book, I have to wait for three months. So, is that something you have also covered in the book? Or could you describe a, a little about that? Yeah, I mean, one of the. <laughs> There's a there's a really lovely chapter and and, and I'm gonna answer it first. But uh, David took the first pass at, at writing this chapter, so he might want to add um, something in it. You know, and it was an interesting project, I should say, too, like co-writing a book, especially during a pandemic, where we would each kind of draft things and send them back and forth, and eventually they became kind of our language. Um, but anyway, but this there's a chapter which we talk about Aristotle. And it's, it's about the passage, the transmission of Aristotle, um, basically from Iran into Egypt, then into Iberia, and then eventually up into Paris, and then kind of back into um, the Mediterranean world from there, um, in which this is all facilitated by the quote unquote church, right? Is that the best scientific learning of the period of the last thousand years, like what we think of as the kind of foundation for, um, you know, enlightenment principles in some ways, right, empirical research and things like that, like, this is, this is a debate happening within Christianity. Um, you know, it's not only happening within Christianity, it's happening within Judaism. We talk about uh, Moses Maimonides, we talk about Avicenna, Ibn Sina, right, um, you know, um, and, and, you know, um, Averroes and, and, and other figures like that as well. The debate is happening, like, so it's not that the, you know, the church was necessarily kind of suppressing this kind of learning. They were at times facilitating it, but they were also fighting against it. And the, pro and the reason for that is, is, again, is because these, these, these big systems are complex. Certain people didn't like it for certain reasons, and certain people really liked it for other reasons. And there was an app, there was a, there was a debate. Um, at that time, like there's a there's a great moment, for example, in which um, the the Bishop of Paris, uh, Stephen Tempier, like like basically outlaws the teaching of Averroes, that he thinks that the University of Paris, this Christian um, university, has been taken over by this this kind of Islamic learning, this Islamic um, under, uh, interpretation of Aristotle, and so. Most of the students, they simply leave and they go to Toulouse where the bishop there and the Pope, in fact, is like, sure, study it there. That's totally fine. So it's it's just, it's basically, it's an argument between bishops there. It's not an argument in which the church has like decided that Aristotle and this new type of learning is, is, is illegal. It's just that one bishop didn't like it because it was threatening his authority. He didn't like the way the cathedral school was going. And so he promulgated a theological and also a political proclamation that outlawed it. And so the students just kind of left and this freaked the king of France out because they lost all these um, um, all this revenue from all these students leaving and he was like like no we're going to put a stop to this and then they made it they made an accommodation and the University of Paris kind of reopened but again like this this monolithic idea is absolutely um, you know untrue and, and the complexity is I think you know the richness of that past is, is what's so interesting about the period. And, and you know what I want to say, what, what Matt is what Matt is saying here too, is that both banning Aristotle in Paris 
and teaching Aristotle in Toulouse are equally medieval. They are equally part of the Middle Ages. They both exist at the same time. Um, they exist in conflict, but not in conflict for us as historians to say, hey, there are two ideas here, right? Look at any place at any time, there might be two ideas. There might be two million ideas. Um, the, the Middle Ages had lots of ideas. In terms of the specificity of science, and specificity of science, we don't go into it a lot in part because of the other book that you talk about, The Light Ages, which we didn't know about. We named our book, but we love. We think Seb Falk uh, is great and we think it's a great book and wholly endorse it. And so, you know, if that's something that people are interested in, they should go read that book uh, because it's really just taking this angle and, and pulling it out. But that's also part of the mission of our book. We, we think there's been a lot of really good publicly oriented writing on pieces of the Middle Ages or groups or, or, or narrower times by people, by, by other scholars who are doing really great work and are, are no more trapped in the myth of the Dark Ages than we are. Um, we tried to do something that was big and took the whole thousand years. Um, and, you know, next someone may do the whole thousand years for the whole planet. That would be even bigger, right? That, that's not the project we did. Um, I don't think we could, but, it, you know, that would be a project too. Um, maybe they would have to have 10 authors or something. But, you know, so there's different ways of going at this question. And Matt and I, I think, are both happy to be in a community of people doing this work. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Ryan mentioned that the uh, Middle Ages is a very complex time. And as you mentioned, there are different, medic, yeah, there are different people out there who might have more, who might have had different interpretations of the work. And when I, uh, some time ago, when I was reading uh, Stephen Greenblatt's book, which he's a highly respected scholar, that I do respect his, um, uh, his, his, his scholarship in, on, on Shakespeare. But when I read that book, there were just sentences which were outright wrong. For example, one of them was like, you know, uh, just quoting from the book, no medieval monk would ever have been encouraged to read between the lines or to be interested in books was already an oddity. Uh, I think comments like that, which uh, I mean, like to me, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm an enthusiast in the history of the Middle East, but you're experts, so I can imagine how annoying and frustrating it must have been to read <laughs> such sentences in that book. Yeah. And um, uh, just on that, you're both historians of Middle Ages. If you were to choose one myth, which is the most annoying one, what would it be? Ooh. Difficult to choose, I know there are plenty. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess the one that, that I would go at, which Matt may be now grumpy that I take, is the myth of the, the eternal clash of civilizations between, um, be, between Islam and Christianity in particular. Um, that's not the most, that may not be the most annoying one. The one that really annoys me is about feudalism. Um, I get really annoyed about that. But I think the one that matters um, is that there is um, an idea that somehow throughout the Middle Ages, or at least certainly since the beginning of the First Crusade, that there's just nothing but conflict and the conflict is inexorable and the conflict is eternal and the conflict has implications for today that the conflict is ongoing. Um, and that is a myth that comes out of kind of an analysis of the Middle Ages and is for one, very harmful to us today. And second is just not true that um, as with everything else we're talking about, uh, multiple realities, multiple ways exist within the same time and often within the same person or the same you know, groups of people um, moving kind of relatively easily in and out of loose coexistence, what another a friend of ours calls rough tolerance or, and then really quite you know, polemical uh, nastiness and, and even violence. And that um, we, have to, we have to look with more, we have to tell a different kind of story about that. Yeah, mine kind of builds on that, like, and, and I am annoyed at David that he took that one, um, because that was the one I was going to say too. Um, but uh, um, is, is another one which kind of builds on that is that, um, that the Middle Ages were universally white and male. It's that uh, we, for, and th there's a basis in scholarship for this. It's one that's unwittingly, I think, and, and sometimes wittingly, sometimes willingly um, repeated um, too often that uh, Europe was a closed off space, that it was homogenous in some fundamental way, that women didn't matter. Um, and that's just simply not true. And that's something we were at pains to talk about in the book as well, is that we try to center the voices. And there are lots of voices that come down to us of, of women, that there are North Africans who are in early medieval England very early, who are important figures and who nobody, nobody seems to think that's a big deal. Like, it's just like, they are important figures. This guy came from Asia Minor, modern Turkey, or this guy came from somewhere in North Africa. Um, 
maybe around kind of Carthage, we're just not really sure. And they become like the arch, uh, you know, the abbot of, um, you know, a monastery in Canterbury and, and they, they lead reform and people send their, their children to be to, to study with him and he influences like basically a whole generation and, and perhaps several generations of people right and this has been backed up by archaeological discoveries all across northern Europe like in Scandinavia and um, you know in the in the United Kingdom and across France and stuff like that is that people appeared and, and looked different from one another and this was a weird thing that's not to say you know the vast majority of people were um, of a darker skin tone or um, Islamic or or something like that but there were people there, you know, this is this is something even that we talk about in, in a chapter which we talk about kind of the origins of, of Islam is that, you know, Islam has part of European history and has been a part of European history since since its inception. Um, and because there were there were Muslims in Europe from very early on and they interacted and they played a part in, in what's in, in what happened, not just in Iberia, but in, you know, the modern states of France and Italy and Germany and places like that. And we, we can't we can't ignore that. And if we do ignore that, we're really only telling part of the story about the past and we're not just we're doing violence to um, um, to their to their stories. And, and there are more annoying, you know, myths that would categorize as more annoying. Medieval people did take baths. They liked to take baths. Medieval people liked food that tasted good. They didn't just put lots of seasoning in it because they ate rotten meat. People don't, you know, they, they did preserve meat. They knew how to preserve meat. That's a pretty essential survival skill. They liked good food. Um, you know, the, that kings were absolute rulers. That's really an early modern phenomenon, sort of the, the idea of absolutism. Medieval king, kingship, medieval rulership in general was always highly contingent and, and, and hemmed in by traditions and laws and, and um, you know, and, and other powers. I mean, that, you know, there's, there's so there's plenty of, of kind of narrow myths that are just a little bit annoying and are fun to debunk, but they do all add up to this idea of a kind of, simplistic backwards isolated time and place that that you know was just sort of you know the the biggest man with the biggest stick ruled everything and and it, it erases complexity in a way that i think is really a problem um when all added together thank you you both raised excellent points and uh gave rise to many other questions that one of them especially is about the white middle ages and also the appropriation of the uh, icons of the middle ages by white supremacist groups which i'll uh, bring up later on and um there, matthew also mentioned that there were a lot of uh, influential women as well in the middle ages we had um, marjorie camp christian de pizan who was one of the first ladies who actually to, to speak about it from a modern perspective was the first ladies who wrote about women's rights and uh it, it, i think uh, david you had listened to an interview earlier that you said one of the chapters that you had to i'm sorry i have to bring it up because i know it was a painful thing to you right it was the lady of tuscany if i'm not mistaken right yeah yeah, yeah. I, I i cut a section on matilda of tuscany who is just one of the most interesting people in you know in the 12th 11th century she's just i mean she's just one of the most interesting figures in the high in sort of the central middle ages in general we had to cut a lot of things. I mean, um, you know, there's just, there are enormously important people and places and events that you can't, that the attempt to cover all the things that Matthew and I would just want to cover, and then all the things that we might feel we need to cover would be, uh, you know, a 10,000 page book instead of a 300 page book. So, you know, writing something that is big and synthetic, you have to make, you have to make hard choices. And um, that a lot of those choices we made before we actually wrote the words. Uh, that was one I made, Cutting Matilda of Tuscany, we made after I had written the thousand words and really <laughs> liked it and, and was really, really, really gung ho about it. But it was not what the chapter is about. Um, and I hope that when people read the book, they'll see that each chapter is, is kind of about something, it's making an argument, it's saying something that, that continues to advance our case that, that we can, that actually, as Matthew says, that the European Middle Ages were knowable and that they were human, um, right? And they were complicated. And that that's the argument we keep trying to push forward. And uh, can you tell us, uh, uh, when you were talking there, we just said that yeah, the, the, the idea of a king, it was not that there was just one figure ruling over everyone. Um, voting was a common phenomenon in the Middle Ages. There was, it was different from today's, but yeah, people had a voice there. It wasn't just that one figure ruled over them. So tell us a little about maybe, maybe the idea of democracy, the, the word democracy might not be the right word, but 
this idea of people taking part in deciding their own destiny of you, voting. You know, general. medieval medieval people loved voting, that they thought voting was a really good way to decide things. And sometimes it was at, it, that doesn't mean they liked universal democracy where every person who lived in a particular place got to decide things, but those haven't really existed in any large scale. I mean, they don't, right? I mean, if we look at who gets to vote in modern nation states that are democratic, right? It's always, it's always a, a, a selection. It's always a category of, of citizen. And medieval people had citizens too. And they had categories of who got citizens and they elected mayors and aldermen. Um, you know, sometimes very small groups would elect emperors. Uh, there's a, a moment in which uh, that I that I've done a lot of work on in the conquest of Constantinople, where uh, the 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 army outside, which is partially Italian, partially French, and partially Venetian, or some people may think Italian and Venetian are the same thing. They weren't in this case, um, and so they they think they're going to conquer the city and they need to figure out how to be an emperor. So they sit down and they write up bylaws for how to vote for the emperor if they succeed in, in conquering. And then when they do, they sit down and vote. Um, I think there's 12 electors, right? It's not the entire army of 30,000 people, it's 12 people, but they're voting. The university, right, is a place still today where you write bylaws and you form a Senate and you, you vote on things. And there's negotiations between what bodies within a university, president, provost, Senate, whoever, have what kinds of powers. And those are very medieval arguments. The church, the election of the papacy, every time there's an election, an election for a pope, that's a little late in the Middle Ages, but it is a medieval, the, the College of Cardinals is a medieval phenomenon and is a very medieval form of democracy. So, you know, that there were also situations where the person with the biggest stick um, and, you know, the guys with the biggest sticks decided what was going to happen. And if you said no, they hit you. Um, I mean, that that also exists, right? It's not, it's not that the medieval, the Middle Ages, you know, and there are other ways that there's absolutely ideas of kingship and where that power comes from, um, that people are more familiar with their lordship. And But uh, when medieval people organize, they often organize themselves into kind of communal bodies, wrote bylaws, and then voted for stuff. And that's a medieval practice that I think people just don't. It's one of my favorite things to talk about in the Middle Ages, is medieval voting, because it sort of blows people's mind who, for whom they would never associate that um, with this time and place. Thank you. And uh, I was reading a review of the book, and uh, there's this chapter on, um, on the Iberian Peninsula and, and the idea of a reconquista, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And um, in the review, it said that uh, it, this idea of the Christian retaking of the land from the Muslim rulers was later on used as a propaganda by, uh, by Franco. So uh, I'm... I'm Curious to know more about that chapter. And like I said, because I still have to wait three months, so I was wondering if uh, either you or Matthew could uh, tell us a little about that. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think that this is this is one of the things that comes through in a lot of our chapters, not just in the Iberian one. I mean, it, it's very clear in the Iberian one, I think, um, is about the way that the Middle Ages kind of haunt uh, the modern world, is how um, the, the, the past kind of is used as justification uh, for modern politics, um, society, culture, et cetera. So in this particular case, um, you know, we make the argument, we're not the first to make this argument, we're, we're building upon, you know, the works of, of many other scholars who have done much more work on this than, than ours, than, than we have, sorry, um, is that the idea of the Reconquista is itself a, 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 um, a propagandistic term. Right, because you're reconquering, reconquista means reconquest, but like it's a reconquest from what and from what period? In the same way that when you know um, people talk about the Christian reconquest of Jerusalem during the First Crusade in 1099, like it had been under Islamic control for 400, 460 years by that time. Like it doesn't make any sense to say it was kind of reconquered. It was conquered, um, you know, and and just that that uh, slight semantic shift says that this isn't, um, you know, it doesn't wholly belong to the people reconquering, but it's just, it's being taken in the way that perhaps it had been, been taken before. And so this happens in, in, in modern Spanish history in that Franco in the 1930s, the fascists um, who were overthrowing the, the democratic um, uh, government in Spain at the time is that they were, they were using this idea of reconquista to justify their own existence is that the, you know, the, the quote unquote godless communists and, and socialists, the, the Republicans, uh, we're just like the Islamic invaders. They're not true Spanish, but we, 
um, you know, the, the nationalists, the, the fascists, you know, we're the real um, heroes of Iberia and we'll use this kind of crusading motto um, uh, for our own. Right. And you see this today even right in that this far right group in Spain, I think it's called Vox, is is using this imagery of Reconquista even today, like literally showing up on you know horseback and wearing medieval armor and stuff in some of their campaign ads. So this this becomes incredibly clear. What, what the actual period that we talk about, kind of the 11th and especially the 12th and 13th century, shows us is that it's not as David was saying when he was talking about kind of this idea of the, the eternal myth of conflict between Christianity and Islam, like it's, it's an entire mess in that you have all these political entities, some of whom are Christian, some of whom are Muslim, and they're, they're aligning against one another and, you know, betraying one another and making deals and, and doing all sorts of things. It's that there's small little scales of, of um, you know, of, of, of conquest and diplomatic concessions and, and things like that that are happening all, um, you know, all the time. One of the most famous instances in this, this supposed narrative of reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula by the Christians is the, the taking of Toledo, the transfer of Toledo from, um, or Toledo, I should say, from, I'm using the, the American pronunciation, um, uh, from, the, uh, from, from the Islamic rulers to uh, King Alfonso. And basically, it wasn't reconquered, it was given to him. The Muslim ruler just kind of got, got tired of things and was being forced out by some of the, the, the Muslim, the Islamic aristocrats there. And they basically just offered the, the rule of the city to, to Alfonso and he happily took it, right? Like, no, he made some, he made a lot of changes, um, you know, which benefited uh, both himself and the Christian rulers. But a lot of that was attacked, uh, was, was um, had to do with not necessarily the Islamic inhabitants, but the native Christian inhabitants as well and cementing his own political and cultural power in that city. So, so again, like this, 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 this kind of simplistic overlay of narrative that we that oftentimes is called Reconquista obscures so much of the reality, which is much more complex and had not had you know something to do with religion, but a lot to do with a lot of other things that were going on at the same time. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask you about the, um, the white supremacist groups, you know, appropriating icons in the Middle Ages, which you touched upon. But um, just as a last question, can you tell us about the, because I read something about it, but it was mainly in England, how some medieval um, uh, poetry from the Middle Ages was somehow mistranslated. It's not really, it's all fuzzy in my mind, but and then later on, British novelists, um, uh, started writing, you know, celebrating the Middle Ages as something quite Anglo-Saxon, as something quite British, and England needed that kind of a that kind of an identity to because it was a time of uh, a nationalism and a nation-state building. Uh, I don't think that's a that's something that you have directly addressed in the book because it's not about the Middle Ages. But I was wondering if you could tell us a little about that, where where that origin of let's say the white Middle Ages come from. And it wasn't white, as you mentioned, clearly. It wasn't completely white, I mean. We have a colleague uh, named Sierra Lamuto, who um, is, a, is a literary scholar, who talks about um, the Middle Ages in the 19th century and through to today, providing a kind of origin, her phrase is an origin story for whiteness. And I, I, I think about that a lot, that you know, it, it creates a way for people for, who want to emphasize white supremacy to come up with their founding and to and to say, you know, that to say that, you know, to, to, to create a medieval Britain or a medieval England or a medieval Scandinavia or a medieval Germany and say this is a place that was isolated, that there's a purity of race there um, that that spent this thousand years in kind of isolation before bursting onto the world. Um, and 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 then and then the story fractures in different kinds of ways depending on which group you want to look at because there are lots of different white supremacists and they tell the story somewhat differently than each other and that you know that's a different interview um and and um and not what certainly not what our book's about though it's something that um as a journalist i've paid a lot of attention to uh paid a lot of attention to over the years and of course it shows up uh directly i, I know in 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 the new zealand christchurch massacre um in in the writings of that of the murderer um, if you if you read them, you'll see that that kind of origin story of whiteness and the clash of civilization myth are both really built into uh, into his so sort of his historicizing of his justification for murder. Um, and again, there are other things 
I always say that not everyone who studies or works against white supremacy needs to be an expert in the Middle Ages, but everyone who is an expert in the Middle Ages needs to be aware of, of how it's used by white supremacists. Um, and so, because because it's a piece, uh, it's a piece of a much bigger and, and really, you know, deadly violent uh, violent puzzle. But there's also, a, you know, there's also a, it's also tied up as you were saying in nationalism. I don't know, Matt. Matt talks a little bit more about that um, in, in his work. I don't know if you want to jump in, Matt, about sort of the 19th century component there. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think what you're referring to is that there, there's, there's been a debate in literary studies about the use of the term Anglo-Saxon. And, and what's basically happened is that I think very convincingly, uh, colleagues like uh, Sierra Lemuto and then um, other colleagues, uh, Mary Ramaran Olm um, and others have, have pointed out is that the, the term is in, I mean, the term has a kind of a very tenuous connection to the Middle Ages itself, but is really um, a, an invention of the 19th century and especially 19th century academics who were very invested in nation building and issues of colonialism in creating a, an ethnic identity that stretched back as you know, David was pointing out with, with what uh, Sierra has said, um, is uh, you know the origin of their their own identity, which is which is basically white as a superior and a mode of asserting their own superiority over the people that they were colonizing, whether they be in the Middle East, in Africa, Latin America, East Asia, kind of wherever. Um, and so the um, you know that's one thing that I think that you know it doesn't come out a whole lot in the book, but certainly we've paid a lot of attention to, and, and there are other scholars who are doing much much better work than than we are. Um, on this is paying attention to kind of how this has permeated academia and the way that scholars both in the 19th, 20th century and even you know unwittingly and again unfortunately sometimes wittingly and willingly today are perpetuating these racist tropes um, about, about the medieval world and giving fodder for um, you know white supremacist organization, far right political organizations, so that when you see um, you know at that the the white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, in 2017, or at the um, uh, January 6 insurrection in 2021 uh, by Trump supporters, far right Trump supporters, is you know they see the Templar shields or you know uh, Deus Volt crosses, Crusader crosses, or something like that, is that their understanding of the past is kind of academic adjacent. Right, which is the way that I kind of um, uh, describe it, which is that there's kind of a kernel of um, you know actual historical um, evidence within there, but it's 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 an evidence that's pulled from these racists of the 19th and 20th century, and sometimes kind of parroted by people subsequently to that. Um, and I think that's that's why the study of the European Middle Ages really matters so much because it, it provides. Um, issues of justification, not just for, and, and that, that impact our modern politics and society and culture in these, these really fundamental ways. They seem like these small academic um, things that, you know, we could just kind of go to the classroom and we don't have to pay attention to what happens after that. But, you know, our classrooms, our public spaces, our utterances, our, our, our even our research articles, like we, we hope they're read by more than 12 people, but, you know, sometimes they are read by more than 12 people and we, we should be aware of how they're being understood. Thank you very much. Uh, before we end the conversation, is there anything else you'd like to add about the book or the Middle Ages for that matter? Um, the only thing I'll say is, you know, is first of all, thank you. I'm so excited that we'll, we're, we're able to have this conversation and kind of speak to different audiences. And that's really ultimately, I think what we were trying to do with the book is that we wanted to write something that would be grounded in the best scholarship that we as, as scholars ourselves could kind of muster, but that would be something that, that if you didn't know a lot about the Middle Ages, this would be a good way of giving an overview, a survey of the period so you could learn something about. That would, that would lead you down a path that would lead you to ask more questions. Like we paid a lot of attention, for example, to the, to the end of the book in which we have a further reading section in which we tried to show like, okay, you're interested in this, read more about it go, there's lots of other stuff out there. There's, there's wonderful scholars doing wonderful work. And if we can bring that to your attention, that's, then we've accomplished them. Yeah, that's just great. I totally endorse all that. But let me just also add that the book, The Swerve, does not appear in the further reading section. And, it's, <laughs> and although parts of it are beautifully written, its argument is garbage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that was an excellent point you made. <laughs> Thank you both, uh, Matthew and David. It was wonderful talking to you, and I highly encourage our viewers to get the book soon. It's it because uh, I've read some, I've, I've I've read tweets from people who have, are, who have been reading the book, and it's all positive. 
gets it's one of the best books about the Middle Ages, which um, which doesn't really get bogged down on all those myths, and it really gives people a clear idea of more than a thousand history of Europe. And as you've mentioned, there is also this wonderful further reading section for others who are more interested to read more in depth about different parts of it. Thank you very much. Thanks for Thank having you. us.